I'm Kathy Schrader, for those of you that don't know me, and this is Karen Wall. Karen's a psychologist here in um, the Wakefield Schools currently. We both work for the service unit here. And uh, we have, um, as, if you went through your brochures, there are different areas um, in the state that they've got us broken into for this brain injury regional school support teams. We here have uh, issues 1, 7, and 8. And our team members here at, at ESU One right now are myself, Karen Wall, and Mike Hassler from the Wakefield School. Is who we've got on our team right now. Um, the what we want to talk about today is bridging the gap from concussion to classroom. Hopefully on Thursday there's a new law. We're going to cover that. That's going to be signed. And there's going to be a new game when it comes to returning to play following a concussion. And it's going to be returning to activity following a concussion rather than return to learn to play. And it's going to first be return to learn, then return to play. So um, I'm hoping that I give you this information. They're like 90% sure this is going to pass. Um, my own personal experience, I am a speech pathologist here at ESU 1. Um, I worked in the school systems for 18 years, and then I worked for 12 years at Mercy uh, in the trauma, it's a trauma 1 hospital, in the rehab department, working with traumatic brain injured people of all levels. So I have both the educational and the medical background um, when I'm talking to you about some of these things and giving you stories and stuff. So, you know, the main thing, um, as Scott was saying, we are going to tape this. And so if more of you staff needs to see it, or if we need to go do some area workshops and presentations, we can do it. We'll know for sure on Thursday if the legislation passed. And what the, one of the key pieces is they're going to make each school have a concussion management team established and fully operational. I don't know, next year or the year after, so... Um, I don't know all the law, but we had a meeting with the State Department Thursday, and they were saying they're pretty sure this is going to be law. So hopefully you'll have a little more feel for it by the time we get done here today. So, any questions so far or things that you want me to try to cover? Questions you had coming into this? I was so glad to see people signed up for it kind of with a last-minute type of stuff. So, well, we'll get going then, and as the other people join us, we'll just go from there. <coughs> so these are some of the topics we're going to talk about today. I'm just going to try to define brain injury for you. Some of the incidents here in Nebraska, why are concussions such a big deal, some signs and symptoms, some management strategies, the Concussion Awareness Act, concussion management teams, best practices, a lot to cover in an hour and a half. I do apologize, some of the slides are kind of out of order. Um, technology and I were not agreeing with this PowerPoint, so I would try to move things around it didn't happen, so some of them may, you know, just bear with me with this. Plus, I got a bunch of new information on Thursday, and I tried to uh, incorporate this so that hopefully at the end of this you'll feel confident enough you can set up your own teams in your school. That would be wonderful, thank you. Yeah, you just have to hit the return key. Right. Whatever you do. So um, when we talk about a brain injury definition in the uh, state of Nebraska, we talk about both acquired brain injuries and we also talk about traumatic brain injuries. An acquired one is um, heredity, congenital, degenerative. This would include anoxia. When they talk about anoxia, it's uh, kids that have had a loss of oxygen. So Karen was doing an evaluation two years ago, was it? And they talked about the kid had um, inhaled a piece of candy wrapper, was it? Yeah. Twice. And, you know, we're seeing things that are typical of an anoxic injury with this kid, kind of the slurred speech, things like that. If you have a child that would be an acquired brain injury like that, 
or a stroke, an aneurysm, it would go on to other health impaired. Hi, how are you? Good. And there are snacks back there if anyone wants to get up and help yourself. The traumatic brain injury is um, caused by a bump, blow, blow, or jolt to the head or a penetrating head injury that's going to disrupt the normal function of the brain. Not all blows or jolts to the head result in a TBI. Um, the severity will range from mild to severe. The majority of TBIs, traumatic brain injuries that occur each year, are concussions. They now um, call concussions mild traumatic brain injuries, is what they call them. <coughs> Next one, please. At the end of the day, what we know is a concussion is a concussion. They don't just happen to athletes and student athletes. Um, maybe you have a kid that falls off a slide. Maybe you have a kid that runs into a wall. You know, um, they fall on a four-wheeler and they crash. Uh, my son was telling me, my son teaches in Elkhorn, and he was talking about football, and he was saying when they had, one time he ran headlong and just two guys crashed helmets together during practice, and he said, you always knew a guy was probably concussed when he's standing there shaking his head, and you look over and the other guy's doing the same thing, you know, um, it can be as simple as that, and it's a bell ringer, a concussion. You know, they don't, they don't call them bell ringers anymore. Most of the time they're saying, we are in a full-blown concussion. Okay? Um, again, we talked about a concussion as a TBI. And, and then, next one, please. One of the main things that you usually see is what we would call a whiplash thing. So the coup, counter coup injuries is that, you know, the brain sits on that brain stem right there. And so if a kid gets hit straight on, the brain is going to hit the front of the skull and then the brain is going to bounce back and hit the back. So when you look at brain functions in a child that's right-handed primarily, um, right in the middle of your brain right here is where we store attention in between the two hemispheres. And then over here is problem-solving judgment. Over here is mathematical figuring, um, different things like that. In the back here, you have vision. You know, we always talk about the eyes and back of your head. You have swallowing. You have your balance things. So if they do a coup, counter coup, so they hit, they hit, they're going to be a little shaky. They may not be able to grab their balance. They get back to school. They can't concentrate in a class. They can't make good judgments because those are the primary ones. Your language is stored more on the sides. So if they do one of those, I had a kid at Mercy and, you know, he uh, was playing basketball. He got tripped, went down, broke his arm. So it gets pulled out, right? Because when we see an injury like a broken leg or a broken arm or something like that, we know the kid can't play. What they didn't know, or they did know, but they didn't think that it was too bad was as his arm went down and he broke it, his head slammed in sideways on the floor. So he returns to school on Monday, and this is an A kid expecting to go play <coughs> college basketball someplace, and he can't answer a teacher question. He's complaining about the headache in the forehead, you know, because here's the attention and the problem solving. He can't <coughs> do it. And, but he also had... He had lost words because he had hit the sides. He had gone side to side also. So we worked. He came to see me an hour a day for um, four weeks continually before we got him back in the classroom because his concussion impacted that much when he did that like that. Okay. Instance of TBI in Nebraska. They say there are 36,000 Nebraskans living with disabilities due to a BI, which is a brain injury. One person a day dies from it, higher than national average. No one's ever told me why it's higher than national average. I would assume because we're a farm community. People take more risks on the four-wheelers, on the, you know, I don't know why. Um, three people hospitalized per day. 24 people visit the emergency room per day in the state of Nebraska. And um, it cost us four, 
413 million in 2009. Okay. He, again, um, they are saying they are increasing in those 19 and younger, age 9 and under, primarily because of playground and biking accidents. 10 to 19 years old is football, biking, soccer, and basketball. They include falls, automobile accidents, shaken baby, and sports-related injuries. Okay, now this one, what do you think causes the most concussions by sports? Football is number one. You can hit it, and it'll show up. What do you think number two is, though? Soccer. Girls soccer. Girls soccer. They say girls don't build up neck strength. And so when they hit, they don't have the strength to control that. All right. And the next one is boys soccer. Go ahead. Girls basketball, wrestling, and boys basketball. The last two, they tend to work on the neck strengths and stuff. So you don't see as many concussions in those sports as in others. All right, next, there we go, the average high school football player telemetry results. The average player in football recorded 652 impacts a season. The lineman is 868, quarterbacks 467, receivers and quarterbacks 372. It's a lot of jolts in a season. So why are they such a big deal? Concussions are brain injuries. So the next slide, I apologize, has a lot of writing on it. But again, it talks about a whiplash type of injury. Um, what the CDC says is that it changes the way a brain normally works. Because of these changes, the symptoms continue to develop over the next few hours from an injury. As, but as the chemistry of the brain returns to normal, this is side in most people within like one to six weeks. So we don't want return to play or full-time academics before the symptoms have cleared because we don't want to get a second impact injury. Okay, so a second impact injury, um, you can hit it one more time. It's seen in children under 23 whose brains have not completely <coughs> developed. Until you are 23, um, your skull is still soft. You don't get hard-headed until you hit 23. Next one. 90% of second concussions occur within 10 days of the first one. Generally, the symptoms have not resolved. And everything you do working with students is going to be based on symptoms. Do they report headaches? And I've got some of the lists there in your packets for you. Do they report dizziness? Do they report lights bothering them up here? You have to go by symptoms. And there are probably nine um, probable cases identified in Nebraska in the last 12 years. So, you know, when we talk about at a chemical level, I always like to use a can of pot for an example. So here's your brain, and it gets its first concussion, and it goes like this, right? It's kind of shaken up. You get a second one when there's still symptoms going on, and it's like you've taken the brain and done this to it. You want to open it? <laughs> yeah, and you know how you'll see pictures where they'll say people had massive bleeding, massive herniatus, hernias, because... Um, it's what's going on, the second impact injuries is what's going on chemically with the brain, not physical. You know, it's not like, a, a, you know, it could be physical because you could shear the brain stem and stuff like that, but it's that chemical basis that's the big trouble. And, and we get into these second impact injuries and the brain hasn't chemically settled down and it's just like taking a can of pop and doing that to it and then thinking the skull is going to contain this. You know, if I shook this enough and put it out in the cold, it's going to explode. And that's what happens to people. That's why they remove part of skulls a lot of times to relieve pressure to take down the swelling. Okay. And I'm not going to show the video. I don't think we'll have time for it. So, But just go back one just for a second. Because I that's that potassium release from neurons and calcium goes into the neurons. That's what happens. Okay. And we won't do the video right now. 
Um, all of this started because the NFL football players with six or more concussions have been studied, and you've all seen the stuff on this. Recent studies indicated that dementia onset in these retired football players is occurring 10 to 20 years earlier than the national average. Kind of a scary fact. So, a concussion is not just an athletic issue, though, as we all know, it's also an educational issue. It can interfere with schoolwork and social interactions, short and long-term memory, concentration, and organization. So we have some keys, and the keys are to identify it early, manage properly, and part of that is the current Nebraska Concussion Awareness Act. The Nebraska Concussion Awareness Act came into effect in um, 2011, and they want a consistent means of identifying and managing concussions to help ensure the safety of those involved. Um, there is some, uh, there's a quick fax in your packet about the law um, that you can see. It talks about what group of athletes um, are included in this bill. And they talk about it being both public, private, denominational, or parochial schools, any athletes 19 years of age or younger. And there are three primary parts to it. The first one is education of the coaches. So, you know, the best websites if your coaches have to do their education is the CDC or the Department of Health and Human Services, the DHHS, both have links. You can link to them through NSAA Home, um, Nebraska School Activity Association homepage. They have some links for concussion for education through there. So all of your coaches have to take that education. And it is on an annual basis. The second part is um, the removal from play. And the parent or guardian must be notified of the date and approximate time of the injury and the signs and symptoms that were observed, as well as any actions taken to treat. And the third part is the return to play. Um, they have been evaluated by a licensed health care professional, received written cl clearance, and they've submitted the written and signed clearance to resume participation. Here's where the rub comes. So the kid gets the concussion on Friday night, the, they go to the doctor, the doctor confirms, the doctor signs a sheet that day saying uh, he can return to school on Monday. That's not going to happen if this new law that they've got in legislation today, they're going to hold on it Thursday. If that happens, that's not going to happen anymore. That's not going to be part of the law. The law is going to be that if they go to the doctor, get it confirmed, um, when they are symptom-free at home, they return to school. The concussion management team at the school starts a resume of education type of thing, which we've got some outlines here that I'll go over more as we go along. When they are free of symptoms and receiving no accommodations in the classroom, they're attending a full day of school, then they can start resumption of play. Yeah. Not sitting well with coaches and a lot of people. That it could be an extra week or two before we get kids back. But let's say you have someone have a concussion on Friday night, they come back on Monday, they're symptom free, you know, the concussion management team was notified. They had teachers fill out stuff all day Monday, no problems. Um, then they come to school on Tuesday, no problems. They can say, go back to your position. You know, we think you're ready to start the resumption to play. You know, it could be in a day that they start the resumption to play. And they don't have to start at level one and wait 24 hours if they're not having any symptoms. You know, if they'd done some mild aerobic activities such as walking already, they wouldn't have to do that day. But we'll go over all of these. Any questions about that so far? I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you. Seeing a lot of nods. No one's throwing their papers down, so that's a good thing. Um, 
The new legislation that has been proposed is LB 923, and it's got multiple things in it. It's about state school security director, required training on school security, suicide awareness and prevention. They, they linked all these new laws together. This is what's being voted on on Thursday. Um, tornado preparedness for school personnel and provide for a concussion protocol. And um, that's the one where it's in. Now, why do we feel that additional legislation is needed? The DHHS did a survey regarding concussion awareness. 11 of 163 athletic director activity coordinators surveyed were unaware that there was a burst team, and only six knew how to contact. And this is a statewide initiative. 6.1 indicated that their school had a return to learn policy that provided accommodations for classwork for a student athlete with a suspected concussion, only 6.1%. And 34% said they did have a designated person for concussion management. 62% um, of Class A schools have one. So we really need to increase this. Okay. Um, this is just a, something. It says the students who have sustained a concussion and returned to school may need informal or formal accommodations, modifications of curriculum, and monitoring by a medical or academic staff until the student is fully recovered. So I just want to talk about... Um, Concussion management best practice. Nebraska law does require specific return to play protocol now, but now they are talking about having a return to play and a return to learn, with the return to learn preceding the return to play. A return to activity is what they're proposing, and it gets you a return to academics, gradual return, and a return to play also. So we have some symptoms of a concussion before we go on that I just want to talk about why they feel a return to learn is important. So we're going to just briefly touch on, and they're in kind of the packet also, the colored one that talks about, yeah, he's got it open there, um, about the sleep and all of those. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on because you'll have them in that packet. Um, but we just want to touch on them briefly. So the first category is thinking and cognition. So I think it's two down is where it is. Um, memory, paying attention, staying on task, shifting attention. Remember, for most people, those functions are right up here in the begin in the front of your brain. And so when we do that coup counter coup, then that's what's getting affected there. Um, you're going to have reduced academic performance, confusion. Why does it do that? Slowed responses or processing of information. That's what I'll often notice when I have um, traumatic brain inj injury people that I work with. You ask them a question and they'll look at you. And and you think they don't understand or they haven't heard you, it's just a slowed processing time that you have to deal with. The other things, however, which are surprising are the sleep and fatigue red flag flags. Um, they tend to last longer than other symptoms, and they can be irritability, confusion, memory problems. You'll get a kid with a concussion or a mild traumatic brain injury, and they want to rest during the day. They want to, because they need to. Um, it's still a symptom. You know, they want to lay down. They want to get away from the lights. Um, they say, I'm sleeping 10 to 12 hours a night, and that's just not enough. So we, we ask questions about sleep and fatigue. Physical red flags include looking for things like headaches, blurred visions, balance, and then changes in alertness, taste, and smell. The taste is the, one, the other one that surprises me, but you know, remember again that swallowing's back here, 
And so your taste can get affected, but you'll have kids um, suddenly craving sweets. I've seen a lot of kids with more severe traumatic brain injuries get really fat really fast because they crave sugar. And before they might have been a sour person or something like that, and now they want the sugar. The social-emotional red flags can be impulsive behaviors, trouble starting conversations, changes in mood, which could be depression, defiance, confusion, or decreased motivation. As we all know, these things are going to impact the classroom performance in these areas. Um, there are going to be the memory challenges, and then when they know they should know that, then they have this trouble, then they talk about, you know, uh, it's emotional for them because I should know this. You know, I've always known this before. I've always been able to do this before. Why don't I know this anymore? You know, this is what they'll often say. I don't get it. You know, school's never been hard for me. Why is school hard right now? And so it's going to substantially impact the classroom performance. Okay. So we're going to talk some now about um, managing concussions. Keeping in mind, um, I told the people that were here a little earlier, technology was not nice to me when I tried to put this together. So some of my slides are repeats and stuff, and I apologize, but we'll, we'll go with it there. So. Um, one of the things that they would like to see us do, it can be your current student assistance team, but you're going to have to have a concussion management team, and you're going to have to have a point person in every school building for this concussion management team. So the point person, if there is a nurse, would be our first choice. <laughs> you love to hear that nurses come. Get on board, that's right, yeah. But you usually are the first point person anyway. If there's not a full-time nurse in a building, it can be an administrator, it can be a guidance counselor, whoever, because um, it's not always going to be a student athlete that gets hurt. So a lot of times people don't use the athletic director because, um, it's, it, you know, sometimes it's an elementary kid that falls off the slide or something like that. I do have, um, that I could forward you, some Google Docs that uh, like Omaha and Lincoln are using. And so if a kid gets an injury, it, they start a Google Doc on the kid to track them, is what they do. So, okay, next, next one. This is one of the ones that I don't want. <laughs> One of the things that's important for parents to know immediately is return to activity restrictions. And these are some of the things that, particularly the first 24 hours, that we want to restrict. And what we want to restrict is cognitive thinking activities. This includes all of these, which is surprising. Texting, using a cell phone, um, even piano lessons, blowing on a musical instrument. I don't know why <laughs> they say that's a biggie. I assume pressure, wouldn't you assume pressure? Um, studying for or taking a test. These need to be restricted for 24 to 48 hours after a concussion. Or until when they do these for I think it's step one in the return to learn protocol piece. Um, return to academic progression in here. And this one that's got this on the front. It talks about uh, return to academic progression. This is what parents need to know when they can do up to 30 minutes of mental exertion, any of these things up here, then they can return to school part-time to begin with. Questions about that piece so far? Okay. 
Next one. You know, when we talk about return to learn, we're looking at the student and we're looking at everybody involved with the student. So we're going to have to do a lot of um, talking about it. So this is where my slides get a little messy and I apologize. So the next one, supporting students following concussions. You know, we need to provide knowledge about concussions as a mild TBI, training for all coaches, athlete, parents, and school staff about concussion management, and a concussion management team with a designated contact person. <coughs> Those are going to be the three biggies. This is going to be available on our YouTube, Scott said. Um, and we can, we, I may be available at various times if a school district wants me to come in and talk. You know, we might be able to arrange something like that, or we can have another area one. But um, this information has to go out to people. Next one, the concussion management team. The members, you have a list in there. And it kind of, this one to me really shows things nicely. It looks like this. I think you have that in there, your packet. If not, I'll make sure we get copies of that. Do you see it someplace? And it says bridging the gap, gap from concussion to learn. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, um, Nebraska Concussion Management Recommended Best Practices. It's, on, it's in this bridging the gap piece, and it's right here. Okay, so um, concussion management team, they've got some lists of who the members can include. Healthcare professionals, parents, school administrators, you know, they've got some listed there. The um, responsibilities are also listed. The nice thing about the charts that are included with the material is you don't have to think about what the symptoms may be. They are listed for you in the handouts there. The concussion management team, um, the next one, oh, wait a minute, I think that one, anyway. We want to make sure that they assess and address physical, cognitive, behavioral, emotional symptoms, individual plans for schedule adjustments, supports, <coughs> academics, and physical activity, the ones that are listed here on these sheets. They're going to meet regularly to review and adjust accommodations, notify school staff of updates, follow a gradual return to activity for academics and athletics. After symptoms subside, there are no <coughs> academic concerns. Clearance from a medical provider and consultation with the concussion management team. So they go through the return to academics when they have no supports in place, when they have no symptoms that have been noticed, they return to their medical provider and they get a form for a gradual return um, for play at that point. So it's not they go on Friday night and he says stay out one day and you start again. Um, that it's going to be based on that they have to be clear academically before they can return to play. So, Mike Hassler is a football coach here in Wakefield. I don't know if any of you know. And he joined our team this year, and we went to a workshop, and he said, well, you know, parents and, co parents and students are going to lie. <laughs> well, that's kind of the pretty thing about what the state's proposing. They want the contact person, the point person, to daily check with teachers and say, do you see any symptoms? Do you see any signs? And their assumption is the teachers won't lie. So when the coaches get the kids, they're ready to start the progression to play. And they're not still, they take them out for a half an hour and then the kid's got a raging headache that night. It could happen. I mean, you know. As they go back, it could, but generally, if they have no accommodations in place, they're going to be ready to start the return to play. So what do you do with a non-athletic injury? 
you, um, you want them out of PE, you want them out of physical activities like that. You do the same return to academics, return to learn, and then um, when they are free there, then they would have to go to the physician and get approval to get back to, you know, running on the playground, things like that. This, but all of that was in place, is in place now. The return to academics? Well, I mean... The return to play is. Right. Right, Which yeah. The return to play where you start gradually and stuff like that. The biggest parts now is they are talking about, they're going to call it return to activity instead, and they have to be completely symptom-free. They can't try an academic progression as they're doing a return to uh, play. You have your academic team watching them first. Then they hand them over to the coaching team. And then the return to play process, that six day or six yeah. process. Yeah, and it may not have to be six days. You know, if they've already been doing, um, there's some in there, if they've already been doing, you know, some light aerobic, they've been walking, they've been doing things like that, you may be able to skip up to day three or four. They said you don't have to start day one with both. So if you've got a kid that, um, I've got some scenarios we'll look at, but if you've got a kid that, you know, basketball, she hits her head, doctor confirms it Thursday night, she stays out Friday, Saturday, Sunday, parents and students say she's symptom-free, let's try it, she goes into school and does great all day, the team collects the information, not a single teacher saw a sign, symptom, parents that night see nothing, you call parents Tuesday morning and you say, hey, we think she's okay academically. Take her back to the doctor. Let's get medical clearance. And if it's okay with him, we're resuming play um, Wednesday. She gets in. They try. You know, she's been walking to school, whatever. So they skip down to step three. She could conceivably, you know, in a week or ten days return to play. But in the meantime, the concussion management team also has to be checking on her daily, whatever you set up for a monitor thing. They have to be checking to make sure symptoms don't return. That answer? That one? And yes, you're right, they were in play. But the main thing was, you left it up to coaching staff. And now what they're saying is, you first, the academic staff, determines they can return to learn without symptoms. Then you hand the child over, while still monitoring academics, you hand the child over for return to play to the coaching staff. but your coaches can also be part of your academics. Exactly. And that's why sometimes you can skip steps, you know, if they're part of the team like that. You know, they say you don't have to start at step one, you know, with every kid. If a parent says they've been totally symptom-free all, you know, all day Saturday, all day Sunday, it was just Thursday night, they had trouble, you know, we want, let's see if we can do a day of school. We're checking with the kid every period or so and saying, how are you doing? You got a headache? You need this? You need that? You know, how are the lights doing? You know, you can jump right up to full day then if that's necessary. So, um, we had a little boy in Wakefield that fell off his four-wheeler. And um, they kept him home for about a week. And then he came back and um, the aura's the light hours were really getting to him. And he'd have to rest at noon for a couple weeks. He rested at noon. But one of the biggest uh, accommodations we did for him was let him wear a hat. And that got rid of the headaches. And so he wore a hat for two months in school. And all the teachers just knew this kid wears a hat in school because that was his main symptom, was that. But he wasn't symptom free. When he could take the hat off, go through a day of school, didn't rest, he was symptom free then. So, you know, some kids are going to be longer than others, obviously. Other questions about that? Okay. Um, so, Nebraska proposed best practices at this point. They're talking about doing a statewide model for hospital to school transition care, setting up the concussion management policy with a trained concussion management team, and that it includes having knowledge about concussions and training for all coaches, athletes, parents on, about concussion management. 
not about concussions like we do through the CDC and DHHS and the Nebraska website, but actually on management of concussions. Okay. Are they working on things to put out there so that we can do that with parents? Um, a lot of it's in your packets right here that you'll be able to give to parents. I'm hoping. I think they're waiting, you know, to see if this law actually gets passed and then how soon before they say we have to actually incorporate this and stuff. Um, I called, I talked to a bunch of people on Thursday because we had this statewide meeting. And then I emailed a few people today and they said, unfortunately, there's no, like, <coughs> medical form that you can send to parents. Um, uh, and to take to the doctor or that the doctor would have about release and stuff. There are a couple out there that are looking good, but the state hasn't said, here's one we recommend. There's nothing on um, the athletic, on the NSAA home. There's nothing on there. A couple other states have some really nice ones that I've seen um, that might work, but right now the state doesn't have anything like that. That and, and how is it being accepted by the medical community? I think medically okay. Um, you know, we're so used to, you know, the men. So, I was going to, this is kind of a long story, but I'm Irish, so bear with me. Um, I was brought up in Maine, and I'm old. And back in the 60s and 70s, those damn hippies in Maine. Decide to make Maine green, right? It's awful. You know, we have a place on the ocean, and we used to take our garbage, just throw it in the ocean. You take your tube from your toilet and just drain it into the ocean. By God, they made us stop doing all of that. They made us start recycling bottles. You know, they started putting ethanol and gas in Maine. It was awful. It was awful. So, five years ago, I'm standing on the rocks in front of our cabin in Maine, and I see a whale come up out of the water in front of me. Whales had not been that co close to the coast of Maine in 70 years. It took 30 years to clean up the coast of Maine. How is this related to concussions? Our thoughts as adults as educators, as medical personnel, have always been bell ringers, everyone gets them. What the hey? You know, it's part of what goes on with life. I had three concussions as a kid. It's probably why I'm the way I am, right? Um, but, you know, we all get them. We need to change how we view educationally dealing with these students so that we don't get any of those second impact injuries. I had a student that, um, when I worked at Mercy full time, and she was standing up in the back seat of a car, and mom got in a car accident, and she sustained a pretty bad brain injury. You know, she had the skull taken off and everything like that. And she was coming to see me for her last therapy session, and the lady driving her rolled the car off the edge. It was just a little pickup. She had her seat belt on. She had a helmet on. But that ding against the glass when the killed her. That was it. Any other nine-year-old, you know, fully restrained and everything, it wasn't a roll roll, it was a fell off the side, hit the side one time, she would have survived. But this was a second impact injury. And the mom, because I had been working with this kid for multiple months, asked me to come down and look at what they had done to her baby. I never want another person, including parents, to ever see what I saw in that room. You know, because I'm not a nurse. I'm not used to this crap. You know, I never, the injuries I saw as traumatic brain injuries were horrendous and life changing. And the funny thing is, is, you know, not funny, but once people get one traumatic brain injury, they tend to lose that frontal lobe focus and stuff like that, and they tend to get more, and they get worse and worse and worse with each one. So we can keep our kids safer when they're in our charges academically by making sure that we do not only a return to play, but a return to activity philosophy where we do return to academics, then return to play. 
that's just why I do this, because I feel, as you can tell, I am very passionate about keeping our kids safe. Other questions before we go on? Okay. Um, so, the concussion management team, and that's also on that sheet that's kind of got the orange and stuff. Here are some examples. Um, Karen, can you kind of cover that sheet you handed out to them and kind of say how you use that? You know, you may have the school psychologist, Karen's a school psychologist, on your team also. Um, because they know a lot more about the brain than most people. <clears throat> Kathy, do you have the link um, to the other forms so that we can pull up the high school level one? I do. Let's get out. Okay. The, the example that I handed out was from birth to three, and what I've used it for is not necessarily to look at um, a concussion that I knew the student has sustained, but I use it in a, an evaluation process. We had a preschool student, the one that she talked about before, that on when you do an evaluation, I always have the parents do an interview. And one of the things that you ask is, has your child ever had a major illness or um, any type of surgery or been in the hospital for a stay? And often they just say, no, no, you know. Well, when I was observing the student, I noticed that he had a scar on the back of his head where no hair was growing. And so I thought, well, he would have had to have hit his head pretty hard to have a scar like that. But on the interview, they had, had said, no, nothing like that. Um, so I went and I talked to Kathy because she knows a lot about traumatic brain injury. And I said, do you think that maybe it's something that happened and in, in just the way that I asked the question, they didn't think it was that big of a deal? Or, or how can I go about just asking more questions about this? Sorry. <laughs> and okay. so that form was just in development at that time. And so we got permission to use it. And it just asks more specifically, have they ever um, stopped okay, breathing for a certain on. amount of time, yeah, on, pass, sustained pass. a blow to the head. I'm trying to get um, this one. It was more specific well, for, the, for the, the parents rather than just asking, did they ever you know, stay in the hospital or have they ever I'm trying had to a um, that shows surgery? Me. And it came, came to um, show me that he actually had three different instances that could have resulted in a brain injury. I don't know whether or not they did, but he actually had fallen down the stairs and hit his head, which is where that scar was from. Um, and he had stopped breathing for at least a minute two different times. Um, once his dad gave him mouth-to-mouth, he resuscitated him on the way to the hospital, so he stopped breathing for at least a minute. And then another time he had uh, inhaled a wrapper, and he didn't start breathing again until they got to the hospital. So that was really important information that I needed to complete my evaluation because okay. down the line, he might have Probably symptoms in his problem. learning and in his okay. behavior resulting from those things that had happened when he was younger. Um, so now I'm encouraging all the sites to include these because now we can use them all. They're approved for our use. And they go from birth to three, and, and they do go up four. to the sixth grade. We can't get it to open on the oh. Nebraska website. This is the highest we can get to open okay. right now. So is it on the Nebraska Department of Ed? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's this right here in the park under uh, NDE Brain Injury Support is where it is. So birth to three, three-year-old to kindergarten, grades one to five, and then grades six to 12. So they're going to look a little bit different. And the uh, brochure that bridging the gap from concussion to classroom with the green front is on here also, for where you ask for parent, more parent information and stuff. There's also the appendices that you've got and information for teachers for the CMT form is also on there. there. Um, so last year we kind of gave some of this information to just ESU at one of our meetings and I encouraged our school psychs to include these screeners in all of our evaluation process because it's a very simple, just one page, one small thing extra that we can do when we're interviewing our parents to get important information for these students. So you weren't able to pull up the six. No, like, no, no, sorry, it wouldn't let us. Um, 
This one is also there on the website, just because we're on the website right now, that it talks about this is information from teachers for the concussion management team. If you don't want to reinvent the wheel, this is also, and I gave you a copy of that in your packet, I believe, also. So, Did you have any questions for Karen's about, uh, Karen, for that safe child management? Okay. Kathy, do you know, are they using that documentation as part of the um, concussion team? Like, are they using that when a student is suspected of having a concussion to go through it? And that's, like, the With baseline the safe information? child? Yeah. I but don't know. I think it's available for use however you feel okay. you want to use it. Okay. I think. But I'm not 100% sure on that piece. Because I know that they're recommending that the team collect data once the concussion happens. You have that point person, you have the baseline information, and then the teachers are collecting data throughout the day. So I didn't know if this was a form that we could use. I would assume this could be some of your baseline data. Yeah. So where were we? Where were um, the membership right here. Concussion. Yeah. The physicians aren't, they, they tell the parents, but then the parents don't come back and are coming with us. Mm -hmm. So are they making it a, a more of a possibility that physicians can contact schools? Um, I hope so, and I wish I had an answer to that question. Could you write that down, yeah. please? Yeah, and I was just going to say the recommendation now is to have a health care professional, a community health care professional, be a part of your team. But when um, you're in a small, like, I don't right. have that. So right. It's like, um, so, will you tell me the question again so I can make sure I get it right? Are they are they allowing um, physicians to contact schools when there's a child that's concussed? Yeah, and I, sorry, I don't know the answer to that there question. Well, see, that, that's there the problem. There's HIPAA, HIPAA problems. problems. There's HIPAA problems, and, and there that's be why physicians who won't do it. Won't well, there's a release of it. That would be we have to get a release of information form. You know, so they they show that thing where it shows the student in the middle, and it includes the medical piece. And so the parents, you know, if it happens at school, what the school can have a policy that says if you get a concussion in a school activity, you know, or at school. You need to take them to the physician. They're not allowed to return to school until you have that. But part of it will be, in my way of thinking, there has to be an exchange of information. That's the easy part. It's just when they're not at school, yeah. then we don't have food. We don't. Like, nope. the, like our student that got hurt on his own farm. Yeah. Like obviously, there were symptoms that everyone could see. We knew it had taken place. But had he fallen off the four-wheeler and it had been a less severe injury, would the parents have told us, or would he have come to school and suffered headaches and nobody knew why? Mm -hmm. I can see mm -hmm. what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the only thing we can do is account for what academically, you know, if it happens on our watch, you know, or if, if the... I don't, I, that's a question I have too. So, you know, the kid that does fall off his four wheel or, you know, he's helping dad on the farm and he falls off the tractor or something, are they going to tell us? Probably not, particularly if he's a football player or a basketball player, because he's not going to want a kid quit playing. You know? That's going to be a problem. But again, if we change the culture of concussion, Less people are going to lie about it, I think. Maybe I'm wrong. So, I wish I had more of an answer for that. I wrote it down, though. Yeah, and I'll <laughs> ask when we have another phone conference. We're going to have one after we have see if this law passes on Thursday. We, when the law passes, are you going to let us know by email or something? Yeah, that the law is we can do that. Do you yeah. So we have Write to it down. know. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? Why Nebraska's having us talk to you about this now is they say 
even, I don't know if any of you know Rose Demachek, you know, her thing is, but this is the right thing to do. And I'm going, yes, but it's like really hard to do. So, but, um, you know, the right thing to do from all the research going on right now is kids have to be symptom-free academically before they return to play. There's research on research on research on this. So even if it's not the law, it is the right thing to do. You know, that we do this. Even if the law doesn't pass, we need to have a return to academics first. I think about it as your, your brain as a muscle that flexes with cognition, not just um, physical activity. And so you have to be able to exercise the cognitive muscles of your brain appropriately before you exert yourself physically so that you don't damage it more. Other questions at this point? Okay. So you got this information, and we see um, what they talk about the uh, responsibilities of what a concussion management team will have to do. When we asked this question the other day, they said it can be your SAT team in most schools as long as you have a point person. That if we know a kid falls off the playground equipment or a kid gets a football, you know, that this person's called on Friday night after the game and say, heads up, you know, Johnny got a concussion during play. Um, if he returns to school on Monday, we got to get some of those forms like I showed you in place or whatever you want to do for a form. we got to get it to the teachers. We need to start checking on his academics. Um, so then if you need to do individual plans for schedule adjustments, supports, academic and physical activity, this can happen. Our question is, how do we get an SAT to get team together on Monday morning? It's not going to happen. And they said, if you have that point person gathering information, they, then SAT can wait a couple days until, you know, if it's the kids still symptom, have symptoms, until you can get the SAT together to discuss it. Or you can have a totally separate team if you want to. So the teachers, parents, coaches, and students have to communicate, monitor, and document. In the ideal world, they get through the day, the point person calls the parents and says, hey, you know, Johnny did great. You know, he made it through a whole day. We see no symptoms. Watch him tonight. Is he going to have sleep disturbance? Is he personality change? Whatever. If he doesn't, call me tomorrow. You know, and maybe, you know, if he doesn't have any symptoms, let's get him an appointment and get the doctor to clear him to go back to play. Or, hey, you know, your son got really tired about 11 o'clock. Of course, we would have said, we're going to call you if he needs to go home ahead of time. Um, he had to lay down. He asked to wear his hat. He asked to take a nap, you know, at 2 o'clock. You know, we're still seeing a lot of symptoms. We recommend that he only comes for half a day tomorrow. And let's back up a step. You can back up steps if you have to also. And that's in kind of the, um, in this bridging the gap, the return to academic progression, talks about the two home parts, which is information for the parents also. But then it talks about, this is going to be interesting with this microphone. I did it. Um, <laughs> the school is, Maximum adjustment, shortened day schedule, built-in breaks. If the parents feel they're symptom-free, you can go to step six and try it. School full-time, no adjustments, attending all class. If they can't handle six, you're going to back up. But if the parents call and say, we want to try it, you know, he's symptom-free unless he watches a movie for two hours, then you might want to do the school part-time. It is very flexible as to what your system can, what you feel, because it's individualized to every student. Questions about that piece so far? Throwing so much information at you. Okay, next one. Um, you can also contact a brain injury school support team, BURST, member, us, here, 
and Mike Kassler. If you need a student who needs assistance transitioning, we don't come out and actually work with you. We do more education, providing you links, you know, information like that, training and consultation. Um, we've been in on an MDT, an IEP this year, um, sending information to other school psychologists, telling them where to get information. That's the type of things we do. Any others we've done this year that you can remember? No, it's just been kind of distance consultation, just recommending um, things that you can do in the environment to help the student, some academic supports that would work. Mm -hmm. Okay, next one. Um, these are our regions. I just thought you might like to see this. Next. And these are all the contacts. Next. Um, return to learn must pre precede return to play. If there are any academic adjustments to the presence of the symptoms, they should still be considered symptomatic and not be allowed to resume physical activity. Next. So these are kind of listed in your return to academics, return to play progression. I assume a lot of you have seen these before, like this. Um, this is just a quick look. This gives more specifics what they talk about. Like um, on return to learn, um, school part-time, it says no standardized testing, modifi modified classroom testing, moderate decreases of extra time help, and modification of assignment. And then minimum adjustments, and then school full-time. And then the... Um, yeah, and you guys have all of those in your handouts as you do those. The return to activity or play. The return to play is next. Um, just as a comment on the return to learn thing is that the progression is individual. Students may start at any step and remain there as long as necessary. Return to the previous step if the symptoms increase. When symptoms continue beyond two to three weeks, you may have to do more in-school support. Two to three weeks is kind of their cutoff. That's when you may have to request not a concussion management team intervention, but a student assistance team intervention. You may have to do a 504 plan or you may have to actually do a special education evaluation. Okay. So then the return to play, that's all listed right here. Light aerobic activity, um, then you add sports specific exercises, the non-contact training drills, the full contact, and then the return to play. Again, I, I keep saying multiple times, no academic accommodations in place before they start the return to play. Then they go back to the doctor. Mm -hmm. Sometimes kids are pretty good at hiding yep. the symptoms. Yep. And, you know, you might go two or three weeks and the teachers aren't noticing anything yep. out of the ordinary. And the parents aren't reporting anything back to the school. But then come the third week, some of the teachers are noticing that they haven't remembered anything from the first three weeks. What do you do? You just start it back. Yeah. Let's say you got doctor clearance, mm -hmm. and you let him play, but then you got all these notices. Are you just going to pull them out and say, we're noticing these things? Yeah. Is this what? Yeah, and I hate to say that. Yeah, because you're right. That's our, you know, when I talk to coaches about this, particularly, they say, you know, like, my son played in Wakefield football the first year they won state. My son was not an athlete, and football was and is his life passion. He, he teaches at Elkhorn South, and he's a football coach down there. It's his life passion. Finally, his senior year, he gets to start. If I had tried to pull him out for any reason, he would have disowned me. I'm telling you, you know, I experienced this as a parent. 
<laughs> he had a bat in the house and he complained about bites on his neck and I went in and go to the doctor. He's afraid he had rabies, you know. He wouldn't go. I could, and my husband wouldn't make him go either because, you know, he was not going to miss starting his senior year. You know, kids are good at hiding them. I agree. But that's why we have the, a concussion management team that set up a regular monitor schedule. And that's another. At first it might be in a week. You know, they go, the point person, the team goes and says, any of these symptoms have you noticed in class? So go to the if, coaches. So even if they're clear that this concussion management team is still going to these teachers weeks beyond the yeah. clearance? They say you've got to set up your own monitor thing because of things like that. You know, maybe they get another little one and nobody knows. They're just shaking their head at practice, you know. Uh, so maybe it'd be weekly once they return, then monthly, and then at the semester. You know, you're talking a year out that you'll want to monitor this child. And if they have any symptoms that are noticed, like grades come at nine weeks and all of a sudden the kid that was an A is a D, we're going to pull him for any chance he's going to get hurt again and check that return to learn again and see if we're seeing symptoms. Do we want to do it? No. It's parents. Will a lot of parents lie? Will a lot of students lie? Are a lot of students on the pretest going to try to do worse in case they get one? I don't know. Impact? How many of you use impact? It, can they lie on that, do you think? I've heard of it. I think, I, I think you can try and do bad. I really do. And kids I mean, have told me that. I'll do bad, so if I have a concussion, they won't sure. know. I think you can try. I don't know if it's going to make any difference. But. Yeah. I don't know. What are the other schools doing for your pre-concussion testing? Anything? A lot of people use we, ACE or impact. No? We have, long, we have a long set of questions. I don't know what his name is. Yeah. We just go by symptoms. Okay. I mean, if, I mean you see a kid and pretty soon something happens and there's signs or symptoms, then they go into the process. Okay. And it takes at least a week right now to come back. Yeah. And that's that return to play thing then. Yeah. You know, um, there are some, they call them clipboard ones that got some someplace that they do pre just like 10 questions and it's like, remember these animals and speed and stuff and then if you suspect a concussion but you don't know 100% you redo the clipboard. But like he's using impact, a lot of schools are doing the computer generated pre-testing for all athletes or are you doing all students? We just, do you know? do, uh, no, we just did the athletes, um, football, uh, basketball, wrestling, and volleyball. Okay. So like track, golf, nothing. Yeah, all right. There's like one. If it was a kid, like I got a kid that just plays golf, he didn't get tested. And some school, I think with impact, you pay for the school so you could do every student if you wanted to, so that it's not just the athletes that might have trouble. You know, you get these kids that roll their cars in ditches, you know, you get. But again, time. Not to my knowledge at this point, no. Like us with our impact, we were, it's our, uh, some of our doctors in town, she does it. I mean, it's, yeah, this, through that Nebraska Concussion Network or something like that, there's a big grant, and then, but they have to have a doctor that wants to join that network to be able to do it. Okay. Because they have to get trained, then they come and train people in the school to do it. So there's like three of us. Cedar that can administer the pretest, and we administer the pretest. If they get concussed, we think they have a concussion, they go see the doctor, all, go through all the protocol there, and then she can retest them and compare the two tests. We don't do the second, uh, we test them once and that's it. Are there the only people that can do the release for? I mean, we use the, uh, the physician, of course. Is anybody using their trainer as a go-to? I mean, is that going to be 
part of the piece? You know, it's going to be dependent on what your concussion management and school board set up. Uh, because I think, doesn't that have that on here? They talk about a health care professional. Right. I was Where thinking I had that someplace. Um, you know, it's like, I'm not exactly sure who they're including in that. Good question. Because I, well, I mean, most schools have a school nurse or at least a part-time school nurse. So when they, are they when, using them? Are when they you using have in here that it's right. a, uh, that no. certified, yeah. I know. That usually means a physician or a physician's assistant. Yeah, physician, or physician or assistant. Yeah, it has to be uh, a, uh -huh. somebody with an advanced I think, degree. Yeah, it's an advanced degree when it's not your nurse, it's not your athletic trainer. I think we have an athletic trainer. Is it an athletic trainer? She, she says she can go and clear them. Okay. Because she's got more hours in that. Than well, and I think that's something that you're, I, I know I have that information somewhere where they say it can be. You know, Kathy, it was interesting when I was calling around because um, uh, the Laurel um, Conference schools were talking about, you know, what to do and just kind of looking uh -huh. into doing either the impact and then talking to CNOS and trying to find out what type of training and, um, you know, certification that their athletic trainers have that come out to the schools and then talking to a group of physicians with Mercy mm -hmm. and um, then talking to a group of physicians in Sioux City. And I can tell you this, what I heard was this uh, CNOS doc, and um, one of the docs was CNOS and also their um, coordinator for school services was saying absolutely our certified athletic trainers have many hours and, um, you know, uh, training with concussion and, and post-concussive type testing. And what I heard the doc saying was absolutely not. You okay. come to a doctor. Um, so it was really interesting. Those two different um, areas were... Yeah, and um, I can believe that. Hard. And I... You know, that's another question we'll ask, and I'll get you this information. Because you guys are the first one I'm giving this to, so you're kind of my guinea pigs. Huh? Aren't you all? Here's another concern. You said that, that they should not uh, be uh, participating it's, in standardized testing. Yeah. We had a student with uh, dying of a brain tumor and yeah. had to bend over backwards no. to get him to not. Do you know, there, you, can, you can have a certain percentage, am I right? That don't take that it. That don't take it. And, oh, I'm sorry, honey. You know, you can have them call me because I'll complain to them. This return to Lauren talks about physician slash licensed healthcare professional. And if your school says the athletic trainer is one, you know, but I don't know. Like you were saying, it's like, you know, I'm, we usually have the doctor just go and do it anyways. Yeah. So yeah. 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 Yeah, I know. If they're suspected, we have doctors involved. Yeah. Other questions about this piece? I'm writing all of your questions down. Yeah, and I will um, send it to the whole burst group because Omaha and Lincoln's had their concussion management teams in place for at least this academic year, and they will have a lot more information for us. I'm counting on them to give us more heads up so we don't have to read that. If we wheel. say to a family, uh, your child needs to take the child to the doctor. This Do we player. have to Let's pay? say this isn't the, this isn't an athlete. It's a child injured on the playground. They take the child to the doctor. They're diagnosed with a concussion, and then we do these steps, and we say now it's time to take the child back to the doctor. Who, if we suggest this, I know. are we financially responsible for paying the child's doctor? You know, always through special education. If we recommend it. You, we've had to pay for it. Mm -hmm. That's special mm -hmm. education. Mm -hmm. So what are schools doing right now? Do you recommend you go back or schools having to pay for it? Yeah. Not the schools I know of that are. They're going to start to balk if, if we have to send it back a couple, mm -hmm. two or three times. Uh-huh. And at this point, you know, if, in special education, if I say I suggest you go to this physician, the school has to pay for it. So, um, you know, if in our policy they can't return to play until they're cleared by a physician, I think that question's going to come up also. At this point, we've had no one say to us, you know, then if you think I should take it back. So let me think on this for a second, because I've thought of this before. So, um, you know, our school policy is you... Um, 
can choose not to take him back to the doctor, but we choose not to allow you to play until you do. That would be the word, right? How, how, how about choose to stay out of school? Yeah, well... Then you run into truancy. Mm -hmm. And if they didn't take them to the doctor and they returned to school, what we can say, you know, and they say, we didn't take him, he's fine, we can say, based on his symptoms, um, our school policy does not allow him to remain in school with these symptoms. You need to take him home. I know. I know. I, know. I attended uh, an administrative days. I think it was Lincoln Southwest talked about this this was their their plan they have a committee and and I, I knew it was coming and yeah I wasn't able to put anything like this in a way but it was still I knew that there would be a plan yeah for the future yeah because they talked about getting them back in the classroom how that affected their classroom and they also talked about student body compared to athletics and, and that type of thing too mm -hmm. so and, and, you know, even if this law somehow doesn't pass, Nebraska Department of Education is saying this is best practice and they've got the research to back it up. And I think we're all going to be in on this. And you guys are kind of cutting edge in our area right now because you're attending this. Do, most, do all the schools here do a concussion waiver now with their physicals? Do you have any concussion info that's sent out? Do you do with their students? And you know, it's part of the education you're supposed to do for students and parents. That's supposed to be in there also. But I don't think we're fully following the laws that stated now. Most school districts are not. You know, sending that out to parents and having them sign it saying they read it is one. You know, what they're doing like uh huh. They're signing it. Uh huh. It's coming back. Yeah. See, we do for athletes, but we don't for non-athletes. Right. Yeah, and, and again, I don't know if that's something they're going to be adding with the return to academics. If it'll be all students have to get this training, or again, if it's just student athletes. Well, you know, if that's something they can possibly work on, you know, a standardized program that we can, they can access, say, that they have to sign into or something, that they observe this, this is what the protocol mm -hmm. is. Because that would help schools, too, then we wouldn't have to bring them in and do an assembly with them. One well, of that's the, what we do now. Um, the, but another thing that I thought was really cool, I think it's in here. I haven't seen the whole thing, but everybody that has seen it, there's one from, it's called um, like Concussion 101. I think it's in one of your references. And it's an animated film that they're showing to a lot of people. Yes. Have any of you seen that one? Absolutely. Is it I've good? You know, I even wonder if that would be good for like elementary and non athletes that's, and that's stuff. That's the one we also, I also coupled that with like a one that was kind of a little more serious for athletes, you know, where the you know, football player got brain injured. And, but uh -huh. still, if they had something that was kind of standardized so that right. we could just, everybody was on the same page then. And you know, if, if um, this law gets passed and we need something like that, I think that our team would probably be willing to put that together and we could have it on the ESU website or the YouTube, however Scott set it up, so that people could just access it and again wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel. I would assume yeah. maybe the NSAA is going to adopt a form just like our NSA physical forms that say can you couple up that with that and we will have it. Now the NSAA um, right now, if we go to nsaahome.org, sports medicine concussions, um, they do have a return to learn notification form, maybe. Maybe they didn't. Let's look at that quick. We've got about 10 minutes. But a lot of the remaining stuff that I've got for you um, is in the packet that you've got. So let me see.
there's, um, you can see there are things like a parent's guide to concussion in, in sports, procedures for handling, uh, concussion training courses, LB260 um, questions. Oh, here it is. Cut. They have this. That's it. You know, it's information, signs to look for. Um, signing below the following individuals acknowledge that the student athlete can resume participation in athletic activities. And they have this um, health care and parents have to sign it both. Yeah, this is after the concussion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. After and before they, when they've gone through the academic portion and they're getting ready to return to play, this could be a form that you could have them take. I think, Kathy, you know, as far as um, liability goes, you know, regardless of what your concussion team says, and you have a school nurse and you have somebody else doing it, at the end of the day, the amount of liability that's going to lie on that one person that's saying it's okay, and as a nurse, I can tell you from acute care to every other discipline that you work with, you go back to that doctor and you have their, that doctor sign their license. Yep, yep. They, they are the medical professional, they yep. say. And whether it's a certified trainer, it's a school nurse, or it's a school psych, you do not want that secondary impact coming back on you. No. Nope. That's the doctor that, and that's what I always say to the schools is you have your, that person's primary doctor or if they've been referred on to a neurologist or whatever sign that they're ready. You do not want that coming back. And here's the other thing. You know, when we are doing the daily checking with teachers, you're going to keep all of those. Mm -hmm. And when you consult with the parents and the students, you're going to keep all of those as documentation. Mm -hmm. And you are going to document this from day one. That's what you're going to do. And don't you think too, Kathy, the, the documentation that we collect from a school, we need to have a signature that you've provided these copies to parents for sharing with the medical profession. Yeah. So when they go to an appointment, you, you know, like I'm just thinking of a case we had this year that it was, here's the information, I'd just like you to, to sign that we're releasing this packet for you in, in hopes that you'll share this with your physician. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and that's kind of another liability check is when you did all this stuff and you didn't share it with the doctor. Why well, should it with the parents to do that? Right. That's that you know partnership. That well, you have. and again, that first thing we need to come up with a form that when they go to get it verified, you know, we send them from the football game there. Um, then the um, they have to sign a release of information to talk with the school personnel. Also, that's what we need in there. Um, Kathy, that that form that no. the NSA though doesn't include anything about school. No. So I don't one, like it. You that know. That one doesn't do some good, really. No. No. If, if the law passes. Uh, so the NSA needs to report. I like another one better. Let me see. I pulled it up today, so it would be close. This one comes out of the, based on ACE. Return to play is based on today's evaluation. Um, it's got a return to sports. They should not return to practice or play for at least 24 hours after their head injury has occurred. Should never return to practice, practice or play with any symptoms. And then um, they've got physical education, sports. They can check. You know, I, I mean, this is just something I found quick today that would be something that, you know, we might look at. Um, they have steps and stuff, but again, this one doesn't share that um, we have a release of information between the parents and the schools either. So, you know, I'm hoping that the state comes up with some of these when and if this law comes into effect also. Because we want to be covered legally. The liability issue over and over again. Um, I'm going to jump ahead because we're almost out of time. A lot of what we've got, um, 
keeping in mind, I think your handouts have um, common tips for accommodations for teachers. Some of the things that they recommend is in your packet right there. There again, you know, we talk about um, the frequent breaks, the rest is needed, the turning off fluorescent lights, avoid testing. If we have a kid on a concussion management protocol and a teacher tells you they have to take the test, I'm a swearer, so I won't say what I was going to say. Um, when we talk total cognitive rest, we are not sending home work the kids missed the next week. We are not going to try to make them catch up. If they are out Monday and Tuesday or whatever because they're having symptoms at home, they do not make up that work. The teachers know, you know, they get graded for they get grades for that work is what they said. Because that's a big cognitive stressor if a kid has to make up work. The um, this is the one that they have information from teachers is in the packet also. That's also available on that Nebraska website that I showed you. What I'd like to talk about just for a few minutes is do you have enough information that when someone says to you you've got to put a concussion management team together that you feel you'd have the written information and knowledge to maybe get one started? Yay, nay. Have we given you enough information that you're not feeling like this is scaring the crap out of me? Because uh, well, information scares the crap out of me. It does. <laughs> but I think, you know, for, I think, you know, just depending on what happens on the 17th, it just, you know, it sounds like that'll be a game changer. And then at that point, I think it it we have something to start with. You do. You do. And regardless, as Nebraska Department of Education keeps saying, even if this doesn't go into effect for two years, this is best practice. And our school systems need to start getting this type of concussion management team in place with these concussion management policies in place. This is what we need to do. Can we go forward to where it says scenarios? It's quite a ways. I think a lot of the other things that I had in there... Um, it just would be really helpful for all of us, I think, if we could have something that was all standardized so that we all were yeah. doing exactly the same thing. Because then the physicians are going to see everything that we're doing or that you guys want us to do, and then I, don't think, I think things are going to get less missed that way. I agree with you. And, you know, part of that is they say, well, school districts are all different sizes and, you know, have different personalities available. Um, for Northeast Nebraska, I think a lot of our schools are similar. For our one, three, one, seven, and 8 that we cover, I would like to say here are some possible choices you could use. So here's a scenario. Student has a concussion on Thursday night. She's taken to the physician who verifies a concussion. Student misses school on Friday with parents bringing the physician form on Friday. CMP point person notified who notifies all teachers on Friday. Hands out teacher observation forms. Parents in four steps one and two at home. There's the parent information piece that you talked about. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Student returns to school for a full day on Monday with parents reporting no symptoms at home. The CMT team meets Monday after school and assess document. No symptoms or needs were identified at home or at school. Student also doesn't report a worsening of symptoms. She goes to the doctor Tuesday morning. He signs a return to activity. The parents have also signed the form. So um, what are the duties of the concussion management team at that point? So they needed to be monitored for a year out. Yep, they'll be monitored also, yep. Also, the staff will need to check with the parents Tuesday morning to see if any of the symptoms returned after the full day of school. Because, remember, the sleep disturbances are a biggie. And if they overdid with cognition, are they having sleep problems overnight? So they would have to check with the parents Monday morning. Did you see anything over the weekend? We gave them a full day of cognitive use. 
they went home overnight, did they have any symptoms overnight? And that's what I think something standardized where if you have like a school-based post-concussive uh, plan mm -hmm. and you know I'm thinking from a um, it's kind of like the on the CDC site they have the ACE concussion right. care plan and it kind of goes into all of those things that you would have something written you know that everyone could follow kind of as a, a standard which would be nice. See and but I love day one, stuff. You do this after day two you and it's almost a check so you can yeah. remember kind of like you said the uh, list in front of you. Mm -hmm. Parents have been notified you know problems present yes or no something. Mm -hmm. And you know the thing is is uh, again with the whole checklist thing is um, I, I mean I like to have them stand because people say okay we got one all of a sudden we haven't had one in a year where do I go to get the information. You know, and so I've got something right here. But again, day one would be, you know, are they symptom-free? Then you go back to that progression list that we've got. They're symptom-free, so can we bump down, try four even, you know, and see are we going to move down two steps or are we going to move down? Important, too, as you move down, don't you, Kathy, that you're saying to the parents, you know, they haven't had this and this. We'd like to proceed to this plan because I'm going to document that the parents stated, you know, that they agreed with this progression. Exactly. You know, I think yeah. there's, there's just another step there that it's, you know, everything that we do, it's kind of like when we have an injury. You call the parent and say, well, is it broken? Well, I th you know, if you're concerned, you might want to come to the school and look at it. Yeah. Do you think I should have it looked at by the doctor? It's, you go back to that parent. You want yeah. that parent to help partner in directing Exactly. Over the course of treatment, because otherwise it is, there's so much that comes back at the school and parents say, well, you told me he was okay to go to step six, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's why you'd have to check, you know, like the next morning also. And then also the coaching staff and teaching staff need to talk daily with the point person, did any of the symptoms return? So maybe they're symptom-free academically, but the minute that they start doing physical activity, we get some return sleep disturbances, maybe some trouble with attention in the class, maybe some of the blurry lights and stuff. So we, we remove them from play again or bump them back and then take it.